Hello, my name is Gary Shoklu. I'm Vice President of Scientific Affairs in North America for Ipsen. I received my PhD in Neurobiology from Caltech. I'd like to talk to you today about academic biopharma strategic collaborations. By the end of this class, you should be able to define what industry seeks to achieve when partnering with an academic lab, describe common industry academic partnering models, understand how a partnering process works, and list key best practices for industry academic collaborations. First, let's discuss what makes a collaboration strategic. Collaborations are strategic when it helps meet an organization's goals through its stated strategy. In industry, this makes a collaboration strategic if it helps deliver drugs to patients, typically by enhancing the company's pipeline and or capabilities. Academia often has broader goals, so for an academic institution, collaboration may be strategic if it helps further scientific knowledge and or human health, typically by enabling scientific publication and or delivering drugs to patients. It is important to understand that the strategy of an organization guides the actions it takes to achieve its goals. As discussed in a previous lecture, an organization's strategy should be informed by its value proposition and organizational context. In turn, this strategy should be informed the type of collaboration that an organization pursues. For a biopharma company, the influence of strategy on the type of collaborations pursued can be broken down into two main categories. Science, in other words, what disease areas, mechanisms of action, or technologies a company is interested in based on the types of therapies it intends to bring to market. And relationships, or how an organization would prefer to work with partners. Two important dimensions of this aspect of partnering approach are how flexible an organization is with its partnering models, and how collaborative, as opposed to transactional or acquisitive, an organization prefers to be. We just talked at a high level about how an organization's strategy should inform what it seeks in a collaboration. But it might be useful to walk through a few examples of how translation of strategy to partnering interests works in more detail, with a focus around the science category. For example, a biopharma company often specializes in specific areas to be able to be, build deep expertise and capabilities. Even large pharma companies have moved to specialize in specific disease areas, and smaller biotech companies often specialize in specific therapeutic modalities, such as antibodies, peptides, or cell therapies. And typically, companies are primarily interested in seeking partnerships to advance therapies in their areas of specialization or focus. Appetite for risk in partnership is also informed by strategy. Some companies focus on more proven, lower-risk approaches, while other companies seek novel breaking science to support their high-risk, high-reward strategies. Thus, some companies may be more interested in partnering to advance early-stage science discoveries, while others may be more focused on acquiring molecules that have more data and address validated molecular targets. A company's business model also plays a critical factor in defining the types of partnerships that are of interest to it. Some biopharma companies seek to develop and commercialize products for all aspects of disease management and thus are interested in diagnostics, supportive care, as well as therapeutics. Other companies may only be interested in commercializing therapeutics, so would be less interested in science that would inform a supportive care option even for a disease area that they specialize in. Next, we'll discuss how partnerships are structured. Previously in this series of lectures, we've covered the common deal types. The deal structures most commonly used in the context of academic collaborations with biopharma companies are research collaborations, licenses, and license options. As discussed in the business development lecture, you can expect that many deals can be a combination of the aforementioned deal types. Whatever deal type pursued, the partnership agreement should be built on based on a clear understanding of the goals of the partnership, in other words, what you hope to achieve by working together, as well as each partner's capabilities, resources, and constraints, which will inform who may be best suited to perform a given task. At a slightly more granular level, the answers to the following questions can help guide the structure of a partnership and ultimately the agreement or contract that will govern a relationship. What do we want to achieve and who will do what? Who pays for what? How is intellectual property handled? How are publications handled? And how are risk and reward shared? Now let's take a closer look at some interesting partnering models employed across the biopharma industry and some example deals. 
The first example we'll look at is Pfizer's Centers for Therapeutic Innovation, or CTI. The goal for CTI was to enable a more seamless and interactive collaboration of Pfizer and academic scientists by physically co-locating Pfizer scientists and capabilities in or near academic centers. The first CTI site and collaboration was established with UCSF in 2010 and has since been expanded to cover roughly 20 academic centers. The CTI model focuses exclusively on antibody and small molecule drug discovery collaborations. New opportunities are sourced via a request for proposal process that works similarly across all academic partners. General deal structure, which includes milestones and royalties, and alliance management approach also work similarly across projects and academic partners. The next example we'll explore is the Harvard Ibsen Research Alliance. This alliance was established in 2015. The first goal of this alliance was to increase the likelihood of Ibsen identifying collaboration opportunities of interest, both through a formal RFP process as well as facilitating ad hoc discussions. The second important goal of this alliance was to shrink the time to launch collaboration with a Harvard PI by streamlining the agreement development process, but still managing to maintain flexibility to support a wide range of scientific efforts. The last example we'll discuss relates to the use of an accelerator model. Accelerators typically provide both funding and guidance to help translate science into concrete drug discovery programs or even standalone businesses. In this example, Harvard professor Matthew Scher worked with the Harvard Biomedical Accelerator to advance his kinase inhibitors for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia to a more advanced stage of preclinical development than typically possible in an academic setting. With this more advanced program and data set, Harvard team was able to attract the interest of Merck, who agreed to provide significant financial compensation for licensing the program, including a $20 million payment in the form of an upfront and royalties. Now in Merck's hands, Hopefully, this program will rapidly move towards the clinical testing to enable benefit for patients. Now let's talk about how the partnering process works. It's first important to understand who the players in the deal process are. With regards to the scientists on the academic side, the key scientific stakeholders are the primary investigator and often their postdocs, grad students, and staff, while the PI typically takes the lead role in negotiating partnerships and guiding the scientific strategy, their lab members frequently play a key part in drafting the research plans and, of course, executing the collaborative research once an agreement is in place. On the company side, the type and role of scientists participating in the partnering discussions vary company by company, but they can typically be divided into two groups, scientific scouts and internal R&D scientists. The primary role of scientific scouts is to identify breaking science or drug discovery efforts that their company could help advance into marketed therapies. So these individuals will often be the first to reach out to a PI or who a tech transfer office will contact to make a company aware of an opportunity. Internal R&D scientists are typically people who actually run drug discovery efforts in a company, and they will often also be part of the partnering discussions once a scientific scout has done some initial assessment of the academic team's proposal. The internal R&D scientists also play a key role in drafting the research plan and executing parts of the collaborative research once a partnership is in place. With regards to the business aspects of negotiation, on the academic side, the tech transfer development office professionals, the strategic alliance group, typically will play a key role. On the company side, the scientific scouts or business development professionals will lead business aspects of the partnering process. Finally, both the company and academic institution will have transactional and IP attorneys involved to assess the proposed partnership from a legal perspective and lead the development of partnership agreement. Next, let's review the typical high-level steps in putting an academic industry partnership in place. Typically, the genesis of the process is the interest of a PI in seeking an industry partner to help fund and or advance a therapeutically relevant finding or drug discovery effort into a medicine, or a company's interest in the expertise or capabilities of a primary investigator to help advance one of their drug discovery efforts. The next critical step is making contact with the potential academic or industry partner. Historically, this was a surprisingly and unfortunately challenging step. However, with the growing sophistication of tech transfer offices and the proliferation of scientific scouting teams, this process is finding interested potential partners has become less challenging, but is still far from efficient. The next step in a company's partnering process is 
for the scientific scout to evaluate the academic group's proposal for strategic fit. As we discussed previously, this assessment will include if the proposal fits with the company's area of focus, therapeutic modality, etc., as well as the company's risk tolerance and business model and other elements of the company's strategy. If there is a good strategic fit, and the science seems to be sound at a high level, the next step would be for the academic and company scientists to have in-depth scientific discussions. Initially, these would be non-confidential discussions. In other words, discussions and information exchange not governed by confidentiality agreements. If there is mutual interest in pursuing discussions at a greater level of depth, often confidentiality agreements are put into place to ensure information exchange by each of the groups are not shared by third parties and is only used for the purposes of advancing potential partnership. The next key step is developing a clear and thorough research plan with a well-defined decision points built on aligned and well-articulated project goals. This is a critically important step and one that is well worth investing time and effort doing well. Once a research plan is in place, the potential partners can start discussing business terms and developing a contract to govern the collaboration. Some of the business and legal discussions can occur in parallel with the research plan development, but the research plan plays a critical role in defining the business terms and often even the structure of the contract. It is important to note the contract should include a clear alliance management plan describing the decision-making bodies and process for collaboration. Finally, once a contract is in place, collaborative research can finally begin. Note that the time this process takes can vary quite a bit based on the complexity and scope of the project, and often can take six months or more between initial contact to having a contract in place. The decision-making process for approving a collaboration on the company side can vary quite a bit from company to company. However, the complexity and process and seniority of the approvers typically increases as a function of the overall budget and financial terms of the collaboration. It is important that you ask the company team that you are working with to describe their company's approval process, including key decision points and timelines early on. They should be happy to provide this for you. Next, let's review a few key success factors for collaborations. As I mentioned before, it's critical that before embarking on a collaborative research effort, that there is a clear alignment on project goals, a well-defined research plan, a clearly articulated alliance management plan in place. This, same, <clears throat> this may seem like a set of cumbersome administrative tasks as you are itching to get started on your project ASAP. However, these elements will help ensure that the years of work to come will have the best chance of meeting both partners' goals and ultimately impacting human health. The other key success factor is regular and clear communication both during the process of establishing the partnership and as research is being conducted. The more regularly both parties are in touch, the more likely you are to stay aligned and can efficiently course correct as needed. The consequences of not pursuing these key success factors should be fairly clear. A collaboration by its nature is not an independent activity. You are acting part of a team and a team that involves two different organizations, typically in two or more places. Thus, misalignment is a natural outcome without the appropriate tools in place to ensure that you are working together towards a common goal and that you keep doing so through the life of the collaboration. Finally, I'd like to mention a few items that may make garnering biopharma interest challenging. The first is an unwillingness to discuss a potential opportunity on a non-confidential basis at a high level. Confidentiality agreement represents a, a very serious obligation, and a company needs to be sure that there is at least a high-level strategic fit and no conflict with internal programs before agreeing to put such an agreement in place. The second is lack of enthusiasm for a collaborative dialogue or approach. A collaboration is different from a grant. In the context of a collaboration, the company is not interested in just funding a PI's research and staying at arm's length. The company wants to work together with the academic team to advance or support drug discovery efforts as a team. Another frequent challenge to go from initial discussion to partner and collaboration, put a partner and collaboration in place, is an unwillingness to focus. While a particular avenue of research may have many possible directions to pursue, companies need to define focused efforts to efficiently evaluate therapeutic approaches. Again, there is always room for flexibility to evolve research plans, but few companies have the appetite to pursue open-ended research without clear deliverables. A few additional topics 
that we didn't have an opportunity to cover in depth include intellectual property, contracts, and alliance management. Many of these topics may be highlighted in the podcast Strategy for Scientists. Please check it out. Now that we've concluded this lesson, hopefully you should now be able to define industry seeks to achieve when partnering with an academic lab, common industry academic partnering approaches, understanding how the partnering process works, and highlighting a few best practices for industry academic collaborations. Thank you for watching.